I thought I'd do my introduction, my own introduction tonight, uh, in an historical fashion. Who, who am I? Where am I from? Why is there an interest in hairdressing? Let me go back 160 years when my great grandfather came to Gawler. He was a stonemason, a master stonemason. He was only 34 at the time. And he began, who knows where he built in Gawler. I do know some of the, some of the constructions that are still standing, but uh, he would have had a fair impact on the early days of Gawler back in 1856 when he arrived. He, he was uh, 32, his wife was eight years younger and um, they had th uh, 13 children. So uh, I'm happy to say that he left a footprint on the history of Gawler. In fact, probably 26 footprints if you really try to count them out. The 13th of those children was my grandfather, Frederick West, who was born in 1873. His early claim to fame was as a footballer for Gawler South, or South Gawler as it was probably called back then. He was a captain in the 1890s and captained two premiership teams, but his real um, life's work was as a moulder. Uh, he learned his trade at James Martin's and soon after that went across to James Robinson's on Barnet Road back in the very early days. And he must have been a very good moulder or a bit temperamental, I'm not sure, because he did spend his life between James, uh, oh, the Britannia foundry and the Eagle foundry uh, up in uh, King Street and I think he was probably highly sought afterwards, after and, uh, and that's, what, uh, uh, that's where he, uh, he, he gained a lot of, um, I guess he was, he was quite, quite well known and, and quite good with his trade. He in fact moved across to Railway Terrace, lived right alongside of James Robinson right at the back of the foundry and I remember as a, as a very young child walking down the well-worn path to the back opening the gate and just seeing the big foundry there in front of me and that was, a, that was one of my vivid memories of the Britannia foundry. He worked until he's into his 70s and about the last 15 of those he rode his bike from railway terrace up to the Eagle foundry so he just loved his work and he was dedicated and um, some of his work would still be seen around the town uh, we don't know where, exactly where, but uh, in, in all of that time he was, uh, he was well sought afterwards and I'm, I'm, I'm sure that you can, you can see his work. And I'm, I'm proud to say that he left a footprint on the history of Gawler. My father, Murray West, born in 1910, he was the fourth child of Fred, and uh, he was a, a, quite a good scholar at school, but with the looming depression there was no money to send him on to any tertiary education. And so he um, eventually finished up at the age of about 23 in the Britannia foundry working with his father. Uh, the next year the foundry was sold uh, to E. Anderson Sons of Freeling and Dad continued to work there for another 42 years. And the last half of that as the manager and in fact he oversaw the closure of the plant um, when that happened uh, just, uh, just on his retirement. So um, he, he too has, a, has work around the uh, moulding work around the town and around the area um, that um, gets, sits there quite silently, quite privately I guess. No one, know who, no one knows who did it or when it was done or how it was done but uh, it's, it's there. So uh, um, he, uh, he was also very um, active in the community. He was a town councillor and he was on the swimming pool committee when that was built. He was chairman of the high school council when that, uh, the high school moved from up in Gawler East over to the Barnet Road. He was decades in, in St John's Ambulance and Rotary. Um, he was uh, uh, in football administration. So he was very, very highly um, active in, in the community. He was actually pre-selected to the local seat of parliament and withdrew at the last moment. And uh, the successor got in and spent 17 years there. So, Right or wrong move, I'm not sure, but I think I was on the way at the time, so that's perhaps a right move. Um, and uh, I'm very proud to think that Dad also had a footprint in the history of Gawler. As for me, I don't think I've got a footprint on the history of Gawler, but this is a very humble um, uh, project that I've just started to do, a humble effort that uh, I can contribute in my, my own way. And uh, when I was 13, I landed the plum job, working in Harold Moran's hairdressing shop behind the counter, selling cigarettes, taking the money. I was earning the big bucks, $10, dollars uh, 10, 10 shillings a week. And all my mates at school were on two shillings a week and they had to do a lot of jobs around home for that, but I was earning the big bucks. 
Um, for two years I did that and uh, I made, made sure that I kept the job and uh, because 10 shillings bought a lot of, lot of things back in those days for a 13 or 14 year old. When I was 15 Harold asked me if I'd like to become an apprentice hairdresser and so I gave it a couple of days notice, a couple of days thinking about and uh, I said I'll let you know on Friday or whenever it was and um, I really didn't have any burning ambition for a career, perhaps if I kept at school I might have become a teacher going to teacher's college, but no, hey, why not, I'll become a hairdresser. I knew the shop, I knew Harold, and so that's what happened. Uh, that was the age of uh, 15, back in uh, uh, 1968. In fact, it was 47 years ago yesterday that I signed my indenture papers. I just have to do some research on that one, so that's a fair while ago. Um, when I was 18, Harold had his first heart attack, so I was three years into my apprenticeship and he had a very bad heart attack and he was in hospital for quite some time and the family asked me if I would take over running the business, opening the doors and so forth. It was just me. So I did that and took oh, the best part of 12 months or so to get rightly back on his feet and uh, no sooner did that than the second heart attack. So again, I kept on doing this. And, um, and I, I managed the place right throughout because I didn't want him to think that he had to come to work if he wasn't feeling very well, so I took that burden away. And uh, I just finished my, my indentures at the age of 21, and Harold had his third attack, uh, which was fatal, and then the, ask, the, the family asked me if I'd like to take over the business. So with that I did, and I spent another five years there. So it's a total of about 12 or 13 years in the business of Rawling and Freak in the main street of Gawler. Many of you will might recognise the shop when we see the slide afterwards. So that's how I got into hairdressing. Um, after five years, um, I just moved over the hill to the Barossa, and um, you can take the boy out of Gawler, but you can't take Gawler out of the boy. And I kept uh, up with a few things, but particularly hairdressing kind of escaped me from that, those years onwards. In 2007, Ron Mosley passed away. I noticed that, and he was, uh, I thought, He's, uh, he, he was in hairdressing for about 50 years. And I thought to myself, well, there's a long chain between, I guess it's me, and the first hairdressers of Gawler. And there's a, there's a link that's gone. And uh, if, I don't, if there's not a story written, if the history isn't recorded um, by me, it's not going to get done. Because the, I'm the only one with a link to, to all, of those, uh, um, all of those hairdressing, all, all of the stories, I guess. Uh, of which I've got a few. So I did that, uh, started to, to mentally note a few things and I started to write them down. And, uh, and with the, the result of that is the paper that I've done. The paper is my, ex my experiences in the shop, um, some of the, the stories that I heard, the, the, the folklore um, that uh, you hear in a hairdressing shop, trove probably 95% because no one's got a record, there was no record of hairdressing anywhere other than in Trove, going right back to the early days, and what a wonderful resource, and I spent many, many hours and hours and hours and weeks and months um, pouring over the, the uh, bunyip through the Trove to get it. Since I left, um, Dave Oliver, who was Dave the Barber in the main street, was able to fill in from 83 up till the present, he got quite a few. Um, and the fifth source is going to be you, the public, we need you to add your stories, add your little anecdotes, your, um, correct me because I, I may not be right. Um, there might be some things missing or um, things could be upside down. Um, and so there's going to be an opportunity for everybody to have a, an input to that. Let's keep the thing going. Hopefully it's not even you know, nowhere near done. Uh, and so uh, I call on all of that. And this will be, um, the actual paper itself will be on the, the, the Gawler, web, Gawler website. Um, it can be emailed to anybody and I'd also like to leave some copies of it in a folder in the hairdressing salons around the place so that people can actually read it and, and put their little story to it as well because I'm sure everybody's got a story to tell about an experience in their hairdressing shop. So that's, that's where it all began. Okay. Um, yes, please. This is, this is talking about the, the many characters uh, that have gone before us in, in, in hairdressing, and I'm about to uncover some of them. Um, not too many hairdressers. I don't, know, I don't know how many builders there would have been, or, or plumbers, or whatever during that time, but there really wasn't a lot of hairdressers in the history of Gawler. 
uh, at any um, like over the period of time. I've uncovered a few, but uh, you know I would have thought there it certainly isn't hundreds of them. Um, there is only virtually dozens of them um, because of the longevity of, uh, of where they were. Um, yes, please. Number of names have brought that longevity uh, to fruition. Rawling and Freak, the business that closed in 1978 after 93 continuous years as a hairdressing salon. Now, you won't see that again. Uh, there was only four, four owners, and I'll cover those in a moment. Other families included the Cooch family, the Gwynn family, and the Martin family. Um, and they saw more than one generation in the trade. So um, I know Ron Wosley had probably 50 years, but he, was, he worked alone for all of that time. So there's, um, there's four families, or four, three families and, and another business, which uh, were, were um, very, very long, long lived in the Brussels. In the, in the, in the, this, is, um, this is the shop. Can you remember that? Yeah. Familiar with that one? Yeah. Um, next, to, next to the bunyip. Hmm? Next to the bunyip office. Yes, yeah, just down from the bunyip. Um, Rolling and Freak remained on there uh, from probably 1906 onwards. Um, I don't know why it never changed. I could have changed it. Just wasn't a thing to do back in those days. And in fact, I left Harold Boren's name up there as well. Uh, although he'd been he'd been gone for for five years, I I still left his name. Perhaps I was too tight to paint it. I don't know why, but um, <laughs> it was it was a nostalgic thing, and um, that was uh, that was it. Okay. The first mentioned hairdresser that I found in the um, in the bunyip okay, yeah, was uh, W Wakefield in 1869. I suppose he'd been going a little while beforehand, but he wasn't necessarily advertising. He described himself as hair-cutting, dressing and shaving establishment, and he claimed years of experience in London and the colonies. And ladies and gentlemen could be waited on at their own residence. The Gaulers never had barbers, probably until today. Uh, all of the people that came out from England were trained, London trained, and they were hairdressers. Uh, and so this has gone on and on and on. Uh, and uh, the only, the only uh, mention in the Bunya over that time of barbers was from uh, a couple of stories that came back from America, where the, in fact it was Max Hill, some of you may know Max Hill, he was over there sending reports back and he was talking about going to the barber shop. Uh, but in Gawler it was always hairdressers, hairdressers and tobacconists. Um, the word barber was never used and I guess that just flowed on from person to person um, up until today. Uh, yeah, okay, thank you. People like J.W. Stone and, and um, Joseph Hocking continue to um, advertise early in the piece. Um, and Mr. Wakefield added a ladies' hairdressing room where ladies may enjoy privacy and attention. This is, these stories I've got from either adverts or, or little personal notes in the, uh, in the bunyip. And I've tried to, some of them were quite boring, but I've made little stories out of it. So um, they, uh, they all add to the, the texture of the, of, the, um, uh, of the story. Uh, in 1878, there were four hairdressers operating and Mr. J. Rawling opened his shop in Murray Street opposite Jacob Street in 1860, 1886. So that'd be about where, is it the Feast restaurant is? Somewhere in that area, might be, um, yeah, somewhere in that area there, right opposite uh, opposite Jacob Street. Um, in 1884, um, Mr. Radford. Oh, this is yeah. Um, in 1896, Arthur Window came to town. Uh, I haven't been able to find anything about Angerston, but he came to to town, and he was obviously quite um, quite progressive in having his razors engraved with his name on it. I know there's one of these, um, these, these razors are over here tonight, but there's also one down in Dave the Barber's uh, shop in the main street of Gawler. Um, and uh, he had his name engraved on it. And the book, what's, what's in the book? Is it, is it a diary or a? No, it's a little oh. complimentary thing. It's a writing slate, which um, I think was used by a, a grocer in Angerston, because it's got an Angerston name, and it's got customers all this uh, Meat and fruit and veg and like yeah, that. okay. So it's a slate. Yes. <coughs> he obviously went to a, a lot of effort to get that, that type of thing uh, 
um, produced and compliments giving it away. So he was, uh, he was in doing things in a big way. Um, okay, next one is in 18... Uh, oh, in, in 1884, Mr Radford advertised for an apprentice. It was the first such mention in the paper. And uh, Mr uh, Charles... Uh, in, in December 86, he sold out to Charles Cope, who offered first-class plunge baths for fourpence. So that was a new trend, a new trend on the uh, on there. And then P. Anderson was operating a ladies and gentlemen's hairdresser in June '86. Not so much mention of ladies hairdressers back in those days. I guess they wore their hair tied back or in a shawl, under a shawl, and uh, certainly under a hat. Um, and uh, ladies did get some mention, but not as much as, uh, as what you might have expected, or perhaps they just didn't advertise, but uh, um, it was uh, uh, certainly a lack of, of ladies mentioned there. And um, Arthur, um, a. a. D. Mackenzie opened up a tobacconist hairdresser near the old spot in 1890, but the very next month he died, and a sell-off of, of all of his equipment and goods took place. So he was one of the short-lived hairdressers of the town, living just, uh, just one month before he, uh, before he carked it. In the 1900s, okay, in, on the 8th of February 1900, the following notice appeared in the Bunyip. The undersigned hairdressers and tobacconists beg to notify the public that their respective establishments will, after the, March the 5th, close at 8 o'clock each evening except on Wednesday the 22nd when they will be closed at 1 p.m. and not reopen until the following day. On Saturdays they will remain open until 10.30 p.m. Well. So they did, did some long hours. Now that's, uh, that's in 1900. They have uh, any power back in 1900? No. Uh, Mr. W Mr. Uh, uh, Wakefield, the first hairdresser, said he'll cut hair until it's dark. That was one of his mottos. Uh, he, he obviously had the, the Tilly Lantern or something there, but uh, yeah, so he, he would cut hair until dark, whatever that meant back in the day. So there's uh, Arthur Window, R.J. Hill and J. Rawling, who were those hairdressers back in 1900. Um, the next one is Will A. Cooch. That's Bert's father. He opened next to the Old Spot Hotel in 1900 and John Rawling and Arthur Window were frequently offering their services and fancy goods in weekly adverts in the Bunyip. They were pushing their adverts pretty, pretty well to buy these, these types of things. Uh, and the next one is 1904. Mr J Rawling, Johnny Rawling announced that he'd taken into partnership Mr Fred Freak who had considerable experience in wig making and ladies hairdressing and he'd also been working there for eight years already. So uh, that was the first mention of Fred Freak, but he was now in the partnership. And that name, as I said before, remained on the door until 1978, mm. even though Fred died earlier. Um, and the next one is in April 1911. Oh, hang on. Um, Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, 1906, uh, um, Arthur Window sold his business to Herb Gwynn. Uh, and Mr. Window operated the, the saloon for 14 years. So um, that's late, and the raises we just saw, he was only operating here 14 years, sold the business to Herb Gwynn. And so another dynasty started back there in, in 1906. In 1911, hairdressers raised their prices as follows shaves. Fourpence and haircuts, ninepence, and on Saturdays up to a shilling. Um, and uh, that was quite a rise, I guess, back in those days. Um, a fair, fair percentage. And um, the next one is February 12, Jay Scurry opened a saloon and tobacconist on Block Road, Gawler South, next to the news agency. We were just talking about that a moment ago. Um, and... Um, I'm trying to uh, pick out the, the bits and I don't, I don't want you to uh, deprive you of reading the whole story. Uh, the next one should be head, head... Oh, that's right, yes. Mr Cooch claimed to have the finest hairdressing uh, outside of Adelaide. Hard to imagine what it might have looked like back in those days or what it had to be. And the next one. Hairdressers up to... Nine, this is interesting. Hairdressers up until 1921 seemed to have a monopoly on the sales of tobacco and, sp and smoking requisites 
which they guarded vigorously. Even the law was on their side. The act actually said that um, hairdressers and tobacconists would sell their cigarettes and tobacco, and other people could do as well, as long as the hairdressers were open. Now, once the hairdresser closed, no one could sell any. So it was a, it was a closed shop uh, in the times, I guess, after hours or on Sundays or uh, Saturday afternoons and that type of thing. So uh, that was quite, quite a fascinating little uh, find. But um, there was pressure to bear um, from people, I guess, and from the government to change that around. A guy called Rolly Riggs opened up a hairdresser and tobacconist shop at Gawler South, next to Scurry's, in that shopping centre opposite McDonald's. <coughs> Did anyone remember Rolly Riggs? I can remember him from the 60s. Yeah, no. Um, he was a, a little, little guy. Um, he's um, um, Murray Mart, the late Murray Martin's wife, was his daughter. Yes. Rolling, you rolling? Yes. Yep. 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 That's right. So um, he's been he's been going quite some time. Uh, he uh, <laughs> there was a story. I wasn't going to relate this, but I'll do it very quickly. Um, there was news around that he'd won a fortune in a Calcutta sweep from India. He'd paid about uh, 15 rupees, and they were thinking it might be worth 25 to 30 thousand pounds. And he was he was just about to. Uh, to start celebrating, but in fact it wasn't quite that much. It was only about four hundred pounds <laughs> less state taxes, <laughs> um, but still that was uh, enough to be recorded in the paper of the day. Um, Keith Martin was a hairdresser in 1925. Uh, that was recorded there. Uh, the first mention of Keith. Uh, that was the time that his mother was uh, uh, killed in a murder suicide up at his place. Some of you may know that one. In December, that's it, December 1925, the Australian President of the Hairdressers Employers Union was called to a meeting in Gawler to discuss the conditions of, that local hairdressers were required to work under. The locals were seeking to be able to work under the same conditions as their Adelaide counterparts. Again, the law was on the, had been set for, for those people working here in Gawler. The new act uh, came into effect at the time, which disallowed hairdressers from opening in, on the mornings of public holidays. Previously they were exempt, but this was now changed and enforced, much to the chagrin of the hairdressers as it challenged their dominance in the market. They were able to open whenever they wanted, and that was, that was it. And the next one is, uh, yeah, this was, there was a couple of these in the paper. Um, the hairdressers played the combined banks in a cricket game. This gave us a bit of an insight into perhaps who some of the hairdressers were at the time, uh, because whilst the, the owners of the salons or saloons were mentioned, uh, a lot of times their employees weren't. So we can assume, maybe, or rightly or wrongly, that these people here, uh, Deficio, Moran, Gwyn, Bednall, uh, Bednall uh, Kevin Moran, uh, C. Freeman, F. F. Grau, W. Richards, P. Gwyn, S. Rowell and M. Martin uh, were playing for the hairdressers team. Uh, this was the first mention of Harold and of Kevin. I don't, anyone remember Kevin Moran? Harold's brother. He was a hairdresser at um, Tanunda when I met him in the late 60s, early, probably late 60s. Yeah. Um, he must have worked here at the time. Um, so that's um, those people there, as I said, we may or we may not assume they were hairdressers. Uh, some of them were salon owners, but not necessarily. And uh, in 1929, after 23 years in business, Mr. H.J. Gwynn updated his saloon, and this was enough to draw the attention of the Bunyip reporter. Some of you may have seen this shot. Familiar to anybody? That's, that's Joe Jacob being served, and I think that's Herb Gwynn. It's, it's, it's in Gwyn's shop, and I think it's her, because um, I was talking to um, uh, Joe's son yesterday. Um, he, was, he was born in, um, Joe was born in just before the turn of the century. So if he's 30, 35 there, would he be 35, 40? Uh, it's got to be in about 19, 1940, which would have put it back in Herb's day. Yeah. So... Uh, Is that Bruce Gwyn on the left? Sorry? I uh, don't know who that is. Looks like Curtis. Okay. I don't know. I yeah. 
This, uh, this was owned by Keith Jacob, uh, and he'd given it to um, Dave the Barber, and I just went in there and got him to take it down and took a photograph of it so that we could, uh, that we could have it. But, um, um, yeah, it's quite interesting. Certainly, certainly a grin behind the counter. You can see the jaw there, but uh, um, I, I'll stand corrected uh, if it's not Herb. But, um, so, um, yeah, the, the, next, uh, the next one. It's a leading saloon. It is always gratifying to report Gawler business houses keeping up with the times. And Mr. H.J. Gwynn's hairdressing and tobacconist's wares opposite the town hall is as replete and up-to-date as any metropolitan tonsorial establishment. Mr. Gwynn has installed electricity to his aid, and electric hair clippers are available on all three chairs, the apparatus being handily available on elevated pulleys. An instantaneous electric heater gives the hot water immediately and his clients have the advantage that all instruments are sterilised beneath the cleansing heat before being used on the person. The saloon has been freshly decorated, finished in light airy colours and the woodwork shows fine examples of Grainer's art. The shop generally has an inviting appearance enhanced by the knowledge that all requirements of, in the weed may be obtained as well as toilet and sporting requisites. So that was... Uh, I don't know, it sounds like it might have been Ken Barnett as a, as a trainee reporter perhaps back in the early days. Um, very well written and uh, uh, yeah, so it must have been pretty good. Again, um, electricity. Um, electricity has been installed. Uh, this was in 1929. Yeah, so I don't know what, the, what, what they had for power back then. Can't answer that. I need someone who's old, Max. Yes, Max. <laughs> power station used to be down uh, near the Ford, uh, going over to Gawler West. Follow the river around from the Oval. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's where the original mm, power station mm. was, I reckon. Yeah. Um, but that, that bit about power, I don't know whether, it's, um, whether there was power in 1929 or what to... No, I was probably only one year old at that day. <laughs> Um, and the next, yeah, the next one. Yeah, in January, this is another another game of tennis between the, the banks and the hairdressers. Uh, P. Gwyn, that'd be Purse, I guess. Deficio, F. Gwyn, and A. Rao, K. Martin, and H. Gwyn, and the bankers won. And the next month, they played Lewiston. H. Moran and K. Tiver joined the hairdressers team. So uh, again, there's a few names which uh, somebody might have some knowledge of or, or be able to investigate those, those names and find out that perhaps um, well, you know, they were in the game back at that, that time. Fred Freak died in uh, 1930 at the age of 46 and um, that, was, uh, that left Mr Rawling and whoever uh, still running the shop but um, uh, the name still remained on the front. And the next one, October, I said, the bill changing the weekly Wednesday half holiday for hairdressers and assistants in Gawler was introduced and it seemed inevitable that the unique opening hours situation that existed in town would soon end. The next month the Act passed and this meant hairdressers could trade on Wednesdays but had to close on Saturday afternoons. And uh, in May 32 the opening hours of of hairdressing saloons was finally agreed upon by the minister and shopkeepers. Monday to Thursday closing time would be 8 o'clock, Friday at 9 and Saturdays at 1. 